Welcome to the John Hay Library. Uh, my name is Peter Harrington. I'm the curator of the military collection, which lives up on the third floor, which if you go up there, you see a collection of toy soldiers. And I think a lot of people think that my job is looking after these toy soldiers, moving them around, so on and so forth. Actually, that's just the icing on the cake. The, the main part of the collection are the uh, thousands of uh, prints, drawings, watercolors, uh, 20,000 books, albums, sketchbooks, scrapbooks, portfolios, uh, all collected by Anne S.K. Brown, who married into the Brown family in 1930. Um, and she was just fascinated and really obsessed with the iconography and particularly uniforms of, of uh, armies. So much so that she was collecting anything she could get her hands on. And these all lived at uh, 357 Benefit Street until 1981 when they came over here. So um, as you gather from my accent, uh, I'm from England, so I could not let this uh, anniversary pass without some <laughs> celebration. Actually, I used to have a colleague from France. She retired. I think she retired because she uh, knew I was going to be doing this. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, if any of you are going to Europe this summer, uh, you will see a lot of uh, events, exhibitions, and so on. Uh, they're really going um, all out to, to, to commemorate this battle. Because, of course, at the last major anniversary, the centenary, uh, things were not too uh, good on the European continent. Uh, and of course the former allies were, were now uh, enemies. And the former enemies were now allies. So um, more about that in a moment. Um, you're in the lounge room. Um, after, the, after the talk, which will be about 45 minutes, um, I'll take questions. You can go downstairs and look at the, uh, the Waterloo exhibition, which is all drawn from the military collection. Um, but I did not really put the exhibition up. We had a, a graduate student from Public Humanities Museum Studies and she's an intern for about a year and a half and she did uh, basically th the whole design work. And uh, my colleague Ben Tyler, who is here with the uh, paparazzi camera, um, he did all the, the panels. So I really cannot take any credit for that exhibition, but uh, you're welcome to look at that. And up on the, th the top floor, um, you'll see the toy soldiers. And I should actually I encourage you to look at the material in these cases because there's all sorts of wonders in here. We've got part of George Orwell's 1984 manuscript here. We've got three books bound in human skin. Uh, material relating to the death of Lincoln, of course, it's his sesquicentennial this, uh, this year, April. Uh, Shakespeare's first folio, a page from the Gutenberg uh, Bible, uh, the first Bible published in America. So. Uh, this was actually put up for another event, but you're welcome to enjoy it. Um, and last but not least, uh, welcome to uh, all the uh, returning alums. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. And for those of you who are graduating, oh, I don't see many young people here, but <laughs> congratulations. Um, feel free to uh, interrupt uh, with questions, because often questions come up and you think, oh, I wish I could just ask it now. Please do. <coughs> so I've got about... Um, I must put 20 odd slides. Um, I cannot claim authority on the Battle of Waterloo. Um, yes, I curate the military collection, but, but my main interest is the iconography of war. I teach an online class on artists and images of war, and I've published quite a lot of material on how artists have represented war. So that's where I'm coming from for this uh, battle. So I'm sure there are people amongst you. I'm sure Professor Simmons knows a lot more about the battle than I do. But, uh, you know, if, if I make a uh, a mistake, please feel free to correct me. Um, so I've named it uh, the image in the battle. Um, the battle took place 18th of June, 1815. Um, a quick overview of the history. Uh, you know the uh, 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 Napoleon was sent to the Isle of Elba uh, and he heard that things were not going well in France with the new king, Louis XVIII, and it was an opportunity for him to come back which he did. He landed at Antibes on, on the Mediterranean coast. Uh, the French army under Ney, who had been sent to uh, arrest him, uh, quickly um, embraced him uh, as the returning hero. Uh, he came to Paris and uh, gathered a large army around him. At that time, the uh, Prussian army and the uh, British army were up, up in uh, near Brussels, and he thought uh, they were the closest armies to defeat. And if he could get one before he got the other, uh, he would have a chance of reclaiming uh, the empire. He moved into, um, into Belgium, crossed the border on the 15th of June, uh, 1815. 
Um, he attacked the, uh, the British Allied Army at uh, Quatre Bras and um, d delivered a heavy punch to them, um, and they had to retreat. Uh, on the right wing, um, they attacked the, Pr the Prussians at the Battle of Ligny. Uh, again, sort of delivered a, a heavy punch, but did not destroy the Prussian army, and the Prussians were able to retreat further into Belgium. Uh, had the, uh, the, the French been able to defeat the uh, Prussians at Ligny, Waterloo may have turned out quite differently. Um, f uh, he, Napoleon decided to uh, follow um, uh, Wellington towards Brussels. Uh, Wellington set up his, his command post uh, uh, near the village of Waterloo. Uh, Napoleon attacked him there. Now, the, the night before had been heavy rain. Um, I don't know whether any of you remember the 1970 film Waterloo. Um, when they filmed that, they actually piped in water to make the field muddy because the field was muddy. And that was a significant fact because, because the field was so wet, uh, Napoleon basically um, delayed his attack. It wasn't until 11 o'clock in the morning uh, because the ground was so wet. And his artillery said, you know, a lot of our, our, our munition is wet, so wait. And that delay caused the battle to start later and allowed the Prussians to eventually come to the battlefield and, and basically save Wellington. Now, the English, I should say the British, um, I may one day have to say the English because Scotland may be an independent country, but um, who knows. Um, the interesting thing about the army, the Allied army, the fort at Waterloo, um, it was basically split into thirds. There was a, a British army, uh, a Dutch uh, Belgian army, and then the, the Prussians, Hanoverians, who were allied with uh, the uh, British crown, uh, troops from Nassau, Germany, and I think some Brunswick troops. There were actually 30,000 Germans at the Battle of Waterloo. There were more Germans than there were British. And of the British army, most of those were Scots and Irish. So even though uh, the English claim this is a wonderful victory, you know, it was won on the playing fields of Eton, uh, it really, yes, the command was, was heavily... Uh, English, but uh, although Wellington was Irish, but as I say, most of the troops that fought for Wellington were not from the United Kingdom, and those that were were mostly Scots and Irish. So that comes into play because you'll see um, the Scots represented in, in the imagery as I talk about. Anyway, I think we'll we'll move on. Um, downstairs, one of the one of uh, the items on display is a broadside, and this is the image of the um, the broadside. Uh, this was published shortly after the, the news arrived at the battle. Um, the, bat the news arrived within about three or four days and was published in the newspapers. And certain incidents and events were highlighted in the, um, in that, uh, the news, uh, particularly a couple of um, farm farmsteads um, or chateaux. One was Hougamont, which was on the right wing of the, uh, the British line. One was La Haisante, which was in the centre of the British line, uh, the Allied <coughs> line, I should say. And those two uh, buildings feature prominently in the art, um, as well as a number of incidents. Um, well, just, just let me just put the... Um, we've got two, two British uh, generals were killed at the battle. One was, um, uh, well, one was the Duke of Brunswick, who was an Allied troop soldier. Uh, Uxbridge, who actually lost a leg, that's him being shot off. Uh, there's Napoleon fleeing. Uh, there's Blucher following him, and there's the, uh, the village of Waterloo. It's a very vague idea, but basically the, the, the artist of this wood engraving is trying to incorporate some of the main events. Um, we can actually play a game as we go through these pictures, is, is where's Napoleon? Because in every picture he's, he's so, somewhere in the distance running away. <laughs> so um, we start to get really nice prints by the end of uh, 1818, uh, sorry, 1815. Literally within a day of the battle, uh, people started to visit the battlefield. Now, for the first few weeks, there was, the battlefield was still littered with, with thousands. I think about 40,000 men were killed at, at Waterloo. Um, many of these bodies lay uh, unburied for a long time. Uh, and even those that were buried, was, was the bones were sticking out. In fact, in the exhibition downstairs, we have a, a journal uh, written by a, an Englishman who visited the battlefield in 1817. And he was able, with a stick, to, to clear the, uh, some of the uh, soil away and pick up bones. And he took the bones off for souvenirs. Um, 
little boys, local boys, would, um, would climb trees and, and uh, pull out uh, musket balls to sell as souvenirs. So the tourist industry of Waterloo is that's another talk separately, but, but people started to visit the, the battlefield shortly after. Uh, we know people like Sir Walter Scott and Lord Byron and many artists and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the, the first popular prints came out shortly after the battle. Uh, the battle was, was very popular, it was the biggest news. Remember, you know, the British have been fighting this uh, Napoleon uh, since uh, the 1790s. They were pretty exhausted and they just fought a major campaign in the Peninsular War from 1808 to 1814. Uh, so, you know, this, this, this ultimate victory uh, was, was cause for massive celebrations, parades and so on, naming of buildings and so forth. So of course there was a real market to sell prints, there was a real market to, to tap into. So artists of all kinds started to produce these prints. This is not a bad picture. Dennis Dighton visited the battlefield within weeks of the battle. Uh, the Royal Collection at Windsor has some wonderful little sketches that Dighton did of all the different buildings, La Hissant, Ugamon, uh, the road, and so on and so forth. And he used these to, to incorporate into the picture. So uh, there's La Belle Alliance, we'll talk about that in a moment. But here we've just got this, this melee of, of cavalry. Um, a lot of artists saw it as a real challenge to, to capture uh, this, this massive fighting. So you really can't make out much that's happening except a lot of men are killing each other. Um, so Dennis Dine, we'll return to him in a, in a moment. Uh, we start to get these popular prints, um, and of course, Wellington is the hero. He's the conquering hero. He's the successor to Lord Mal uh, to the Duke of Marlborough. Uh, he is the greatest man, uh, you know, that was walking around the streets of London at that time. And of course, the country repaid him with the premiership uh, shortly after. Um, so he's prominent in a lot of pictures. Uh, pictures like this, which are very traditional in, in their style. I mean, you can go back to the pictures of Louis XIV, and there is Louis with all his command, and the battlefield is just, a, just a, like a backdrop. Uh, here's Wellington with, with his command, and there's the, the, the masses of troops going into battle, but, you know, your focal point is, is, um, is, is uh, Wellington. The same artist did a picture like this, where you really can't make out, there's Wellington, just charging. Napoleon's somewhere in the background, I, you can find him if you look closely. Um, but there you've got the general feeling of the battlefield. Heath also visited the battlefield, uh, so there's one of the buildings. <coughs> Interesting thing about this picture is you've got this, uh, this rocket firing, and, and there was a, a rocket battalion, uh, a British rocket battalion um, used at the battlefield. The rockets weren't uh, that useful. Um, it's these skies that, that uh, really uh, fascinate me. And we'll, we'll get to that in a moment when we get to the great Mr. Turner. Um, John Augustus Atkinson visited the battlefield in 1816 with uh, another artist, William Devis. William Devis was to do the portraits. Uh, Atkinson was to do the, the battlefield. Uh, this is in black and white because the original painting, we don't know what's happened to it. We, we know a couple of watercolors and so on. But again, if you look closely, and I don't expect you to come and have a look closely, but uh, um, there's uh, Napoleon fleeing the battlefield. Uh, you've got more, more buildings. There's uh, Wellington with his staff. Um, I think there's General Picton, who was the other general who was killed. Um, you've got the Napoleonic eagle there. Now that's, that's one of those um, motifs that appears in a lot of the, um, the pictures. Napoleon's regiments all had these um, uh, flags, banners, standards that were surmounted by a, um, a Napoleonic eagle. And the British captured two of these eagles at the battle. And that was quite significant. In fact, if you go to Edinburgh Castle in Scotland, you could see one of the eagles. And that eagle was used to design the cap badge of the regiment that captured the eagle. So you'll see that prominently. Um, so there's, there's one of the eagles that's been captured. So this is Atkinson, 1819. And a very similar picture, same time, by a German artist who was domiciled in uh, Britain, Sauerweid. Um, again, there's, there's the great man himself. Uh, there's the cavalry. There's the two eagles. They've been captured. Um, there's one of the buildings with some uh, uh, Allied troops peering over the top. Uh, I looked hard and, and to try and find Napoleon in this. I couldn't, but he must be somewhere in the smoke riding off. Uh, but this is the typical prince. Uh, these were, were quite expensive um, at the time, but there was, as I say, there was a ready market. That said, um, news uh, reviews of a lot of these pictures dismissed them as, as just nothing more than pictures you would see in a coffee house. 
coffee houses, of course, were, they weren't Starbucks, but they were, you know, popular places around the city where you would go and, and meet friends and, and drink tea or coffee. And these pictures would be on the walls. And they were just dismissed as, uh, you know, kits, nothing, nothing uh, special at all. Back to Dennis Dighton. Uh, he was actually um, the painter to the Prince Regent. Um, so he had a, a distinguished role. Um, and a lot of his pictures, we have some watercolours by him. And it says, uh, Dennis Dighton, painter to his, his Majesty the Prince Regent. Um, he did some really fine paintings. Now, I should say that in 1816, <coughs> there was a plan to create a massive, uh, wonderful gallery uh, of paintings uh, commemorating this great battle. It was going to be called the Waterloo Gallery. And the British Institution for the Promotion of Fine Arts, which was uh, one of the leading art organisations at the time, had a competition for the best painting of Waterloo. And 16 artists submitted their paintings. Now, many of these paintings are lost today. Uh, few of them are really well known. Reviews of the exhibition said, this stuff is really not great. The great artists at the time, like Benjamin West, some of the American artists, Copley, who were still working over there, they, they didn't bother with the battle, but, uh, but some of the minor artists did. But Dighton was probably one of the better artists of this group that exhibited. Uh, these are, this picture is actually owned by Her Majesty the Queen. <coughs> it's, at, um, it's in the Royal Collection. I'm not sure. There's an exhibition at Windsor at the moment called Waterloo to Windsor. It's on throughout the summer, and there's pictures and all sorts of stuff relating to that, but I don't think that's on display. But there's, <coughs> there's the member of the Royal Scots Greys capturing the eagle of the, um, I think, the 45th Regiment. And then another picture by him. He's actually included Wellington and, and some of the staff, but the mo main focus is, is the cavalry battle. <coughs> Then we get to something like this, which at first sight you think, well, why, why would anybody want to buy a print like that? <clears throat> John Heaviside Clark. Now, I don't know whether that's a commentary on his size or whatever, but um, he visited the battlefield in 1817, uh, like a lot of artists. Uh, no, actually, he visited the battlefield. Um, this print was published in 1817. He visited the battlefield uh, at the time. Uh, he went to the battlefield the day after, the morning after. This is actually a morning scene. And it shows basically the aftermath of a battle. And that is typical of what you would see. We're so used to seeing the glory of, of these cavalry charges. It makes um, battle so uh, sterilized and clean and, and glorious and heroic and so on. And yet we all know that, that war is a, an awful thing. And this is, this is an aftermath of the battle. And there's all sorts of little vignettes going on in here. There's, there's burial, whoops, sorry, we'll go back. There's burial details. Uh, they're burying somebody there. There's people pilfering. Uh, we know that a lot of local people went to the battlefield, started rifling through uh, soldiers' backpacks. In fact, there's one man just behind this tree going through a backpack. There's a very strange looking lady smoking a pipe uh, there. I think she's sort of in charge of a lot of uh, pickpockets, all of the, 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 the picking pockets of dead soldiers. Uh, there's a man under a tree tying a tourniquet around his leg. Uh, there's a, a wounded uh, Highlander there. It's just mayhem everywhere. And this is really quite a, an exception to the rule. I mean, as I say, this does not capture the glory. And you wonder what, what the publisher was thinking when he put something like this up, because probably you wouldn't want to put this up on your wall and have your friends see this, see my great, wonderful picture of Waterloo. Now, the same, same year this was uh, published, the great Mr. Turner visited the battlefield. Actually, um, I mentioned the diary downstairs. Um, Turner visited the battlefield two, two months before that diary was written, and uh, he spent a day. He, he was doing, he basically had gone to the continent, he was planning a tour down the River Rhine. But like anybody, he was drawn to the Waterloo because it was still making news in Britain. Uh, Waterloo Bridge had been unveiled in, in London, uh, so he wanted to see for himself. Now, he hadn't done much, um, many. Uh, historical scenes. I mean, you've probably all seen the movie. I mean, he, he's known for his wonderful landscapes and so on. He had done a painting of the Battle of Waterloo, uh, sorry, Battle of uh, Trafalgar in 1806, showing uh, Nelson dying on the... Um, but this is a complete departure because, like John Heaviside Clark, he's really captured the, the horror of the aftermath. Um, but it's, it's, it's typical Turner-esque. This is Ugamont. Now, we'll, 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 get, we'll see more pictures of this later. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this was on the right wing of uh, Wellington's uh, lines. 
Uh, it, was, it was garrisoned by uh, um, Anglo-British uh, troops. And Napoleon attacked this with the hope that it would bring the reserves, Napo uh, Wellington's reserves, to, to, um, to save the day. Wellington kept his reserves there. And the, the occupants, the defenders of Hougoumont, were able to uh, resist uh, c continuous onslaughts. The building is there today. It's in ruins. Actually, as we speak, they're doing excavations there to try and understand a little bit about the, um, uh, the archaeology of the site. Um, but it was, it was on fire by the end of the day. And there it is. It's looked like something from some Gothic um, mystery. It's on fire. But the, I'll show you the detail. Um, this is the detail. It's the wives and the camp followers uh, coming to the battlefield trying to find their loved ones. Um, there were a lot of um, camp followers, um, wives and so on, back in Brussels. Brussels was only eight miles away. Um, and of course, they wanted to know what had happened to their husbands and boyfriends and so on. And they came, and Turner's basically captured this. They illuminated the, the battlefield, with the, the, the site, with the, these candles. Uh, one woman has swooned. Another one is, seems to be hugging her, her dead husband. It's a real uh, anti-war commentary, uh, quite unlike a lot of the, the uh, glorified pictures we've just seen. Um, most reviewers of this painting, it was shown at the Royal Academy in 1818, they weren't big on it. Um, they thought, you know, one person thought it was a, uh, I think, what was the word? It was a booze up after a, 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 a bad night. You know, a lot of people drinking. Uh, illuminated, but um, you know that was just a, a cynical commentary. Um, I'll just go back to this because um, they, they sent up flares. The, the army fired flares to illuminate the battlefield so they could find uh, the wounded. Um, and there it is, although it looks like some heavily in intervention coming down. Um, just an anecdote, uh, a new book's just come out called 1816. Um, and it talks, there was a, a volcanic eruption in Indonesia in 1816, a massive one, uh, that blocked out the sunlight through a large part of Europe and so on. So much of Europe in the summer of 1816 was dark and, and gloomy and, and heavy clouds and so on. And it's been suggested that, that Turner was sort of inspired by this sort of gloom and dark and, and uh, it pervaded a lot of his paintings afterwards. Uh, but take a look at that book and, and, and make your own um, you know, uh, thoughts about that. But, but here we've got this, this heavy sky um, and this sort of like tunnel image in, in the foreground of the, the death and, and desolation and the women, um, you know, in, in shock. And that's, that's a, a detail of it. That whole idea of, of, of the death uh, is really pervasive by the mid-century. Um, and I put this up because, again, there's some interesting little stories about this. Um, this is the meeting of Blucher and Wellington. It's a massive, a massive mural. You'll see the engraving downstairs. It's a really nice engraving. And take a, a good look at that because there's all sorts of things going on in there. And I put a couple of details there. But the artist has basically used the whole idea that, that war is horrific. Even though he's in, incorporated <coughs> excuse me, the, the two uh, generals there, it's the foreground that really captures your, your imagination. Your eyes go straight to it because you see the suffering and the struggling, these writhing bodies, dead bodies, and so on and so forth. There's a man here, uh, he's had a tourniquet put on his arm. Um, the, 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 there's all sorts of, as I say, little um, vignettes. There's a set of bagpipes there. Um, this was painted, for those of you who've ever visited the uh, Palace of Westminster in London, where the Houses of Parliament are, <coughs> excuse me, if you go from the uh, to the Royal Gallery, which is where the monarch processes down to the House of Lords for the opening. Um, there are two massive murals. One side is the Battle of Trafalgar. One side is the Battle of Waterloo. These were sort of the epitomized the greatness of the British Empire. But they were painted 1859, 1861. Now remember, for those of you who know your British history, Britain had just fought a very nasty war in the Crimea. Um, Florence Nightingale was trying to treat the wounded, the, the horrific battlefield wounds. Um, the, the accounts in the London Times were saying how awful this was and so on. So you couldn't glorify the commanders. The, the general staff at that time was not well looked at, looked at. So even though he's included it there, it's really the harvest of war that the, the artist is focusing, focusing on. Now he's an, an Irish artist. 
So again, he's making some commentary about the English, possibly negative. There's a lot of emphasis on, on Irish troops and Scottish troops. Um, so, you know, there may be something, uh, he, you know, he may be making a statement, an anti-imperialistic statement. We don't know. Um, but as I say, this is a, a massive mural, and that is going to be the centerpiece of a Waterloo exhibition this summer. And in fact, I've just written a paper looking at all the little studies, that the, the sketches that, that McLeese did for this. Um, but this meeting of Blucher and Wellington, it happened at the end of the battle, even though in the battle we, we, there's still fighting going on. Um, the Prussians arrived, uh, saved the day, and uh, they met at um, an inn called La Belle Alliance, uh, which was actually Napoleon's headquarters uh, at the start of the battle. And apparently they shook hands and uh, went their merry way. Um, here you've got the British cavalry, there you've got the, the Prussian band. There's even a, a man playing what looks like a French horn. Um, somewhat oblivious to all this going on in the foreground, we've actually got some, a French vivandier. This is like a, a battlefield nurse. Uh, you've got somebody else somewhere over there going through, rifling through somebody's um, backpacks and so on. But this meeting of, of, of uh, Blucher, and Wellington, it was a popular theme at the time because remember Queen Victoria's husband was German and he was also uh, head of the commissioners, the fine arts commissioners that had been tasked with decorating the Houses of Parliament because it had burnt down in the 1830s. They built this brand new uh, parliament and they wanted to decorate it with murals and um, uh, the Prince Consort, Albert, was in charge of it. So naturally, uh, they wanted to emphasize the, Im the impact that the Prussians had had, so, so there's Blucher. <coughs> and the same scene uh, was shown in 1853 by a different artist, so there's, um, there's Wellington doffing his hat, there's Blucher, there's La Belle Alliance. Very different scene altogether, there's, there's a soldier there with his arm in a sling, uh, the battle is in the background. The battle is really uh, secondary to that, to that uh, event. Um, at the same time that Matlisse was painting his massive mural, the great German artist, Adolf Menzel, was doing a mural for a new palace being built in Berlin uh, for the Crown Prince of Germany, uh, Prussia, who was marrying at the time, and, and uh, this is his, his variation on it. So how did the, uh, the German artist deal with the battle? Well, as I, I mentioned, La Haysant, this is a, a farmstead right in the middle of the battlefield. It was defended by 400 members of the King's German Legion. Now there's a new book just come out, uh, just on that, that's defense by those members of the King's German Legion. They were Hanoverians uh, from the, the German state of Hanover, which was allied to uh, Great Britain. And uh, they defended this for, more, for a good chunk of the battle until they were overwhelmed. The French took it, uh, and then Napoleon was able to bring up his guns and, and bombard the, the Allied lines. Um, but this is the heroic defense. So these are the, whoops, sorry. These are the, um, the uh, Hanoverians, the King's German Legion, a couple of uh, British troops there. The French are breaking in, um, the, the Hanoverians up on the wall. So Adolf Northern, um, a popular historical German artist, uh, naturally sort of looked at the German aspects of it. And here's another one. Plantenroy uh, was, um, a farmhouse behind the rear of the, the French lines. And the uh, Blucher's troops actually came into the rear um, and captured Plansenoy, which forced the French to, to uh, move troops to go backwards rather than towards the Allied lines, again taking the, the pressure off the, the attack on the Allied lines. Uh, this was a, an important um, defeat for the French at this uh, farmhouse. And this is Northern's uh, de depiction of it. This is a typical mid-19th century um, war art, very typical. Um, the, the commanders are in the background, they're not important, it's, it's, it's what the soldiers are doing. It's how the soldiers are suffering. The common soldiers, remember these were, most of the, the soldiers in the armies of Europe at the time were, were from the low end of society. Many had joined up to escape unemployment. Uh, many were farm laborers who were you know, unemployed. So uh, these were the men who were bearing the brunt of these wars. All these imperial wars, not that this was imperial, but all the wars of the 19th century, you know, it was those men who were, were dying for these empires. So artists, particularly after the Crimean War, artists were focusing more on what it was it like to be a soldier in battle at the time. 
Ludwig Eschholz, um, another picture of the, the captured <coughs> Plan Sonar. These are paintings, I think they're all in the Berlin National Gallery. Unfortunately, uh, many uh, German uh, war paintings were destroyed in World War II uh, with various bombings and, and, and so on and so forth. So a lot of the pictures that we know about in old books uh, don't exist anymore. <coughs> What about the French version of the battle? Now, I could talk for hours about French war art before Waterloo. Uh, you all know the great paintings by Baron Gross and, and uh, people like him, David, uh, Napoleon Cross and the, uh, the Pyrenees and so on. Um, but of course, Waterloo was the, the, the final, the ultimate defeat. Uh, it was, a, I won't say a humiliation, but it brought the end to the empire. Napoleon had to go into exile and died of Sintelina. So how have French artists dealt with the battle? Well, they've looked more at the suffering and the, the, the heroics of the common soldiers, particularly the Imperial Guard, and how they fought to the end. They never ran away. They fought and died on the spot. This is an early, early picture. It was literally painted by the end of 1815 by Charles August uh, Steuben. And it shows Napoleon basically leaving the battle. Uh, he realizes the outcome. Uh, his troops are still fighting. There's this one here uh, beseeching, I don't know why he's beseeching him to stay. A couple of um, interesting uh, Allied troops there. Now, I think they must be prisoners. Uh, the Highlander has a very interesting expression. So he's got his arms folded and sort of looking like, oh, so this is the man who's, who was uh, unbeatable for 20 years. Um, so this, is, this actually is on display downstairs. It's, it's a watercolor copy of, of the painting by uh, Steuben. <coughs> But this is your typical uh, French memory of Waterloo. There are many, many pictures like this. Uh, the last stand. Um, you know, these men did not. Uh, th we will die. We will not surrender. A um, couple of French Imperial Guard, one very wounded, surrounded by uh, bayonets of the British Army. Because the French viewed the British as the, the antagonizers. The, they don't give much credit to the Prussians, it's the British because uh, Napoleon had been you know, trying to defeat the British and his nemesis Wellington for many years so many of the artists sort of look at the France versus Britain rather than France versus the Allies. Charley, we've got hundreds and hundreds of lithographs by Charley of military scenes but only one or two that deal with, with Waterloo. Another typical mid-19th century picture by uh, Hippolyte Belange, uh, contemporary of Charley and, and uh, Raffé, uh, working in the 1840s, 1850s. And again, you know, when, when you look at these pictures, you have to think of the context of when they were painted. You know, what was going on in these countries when they were painted, attitudes. Um, and of course, the French had suffered a revolution in 1830, they had suffered a revolution in 1848. There was monarchists versus republicans. So all these start to come into play. If you go to Versailles, uh, the, bal the, the gallery de bataille that was created by uh, Charles uh, in the 1830s um, to commemorate these great victories of, 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 of um, Napoleon. Um, but by 1848, you know, those were sort of not, not that important. Um, and here we've got the, the, the whoops, sorry, the um, old guard, because towards the end of the battle, when, when things were not looking good, Napoleon called upon the Imperial Guard, and they moved from the back right to the front and basically bore the brunt of, of uh, the British cavalry charges. Um, I, I haven't described the whole battle. I mean, I didn't describe the British squares and, and the cavalry onslaughts, or you'll see a British square in a moment. But this is your typical picture. And there's, there's Napoleon, uh, just in the background. Um, a, a print by an unknown artist, um, again there's, there's the emperor, uh, but we've got this, this death struggle in the foreground. Um, there's your artistic props, dead bodies and, and uh, uh, accoutrements and so on and so forth. And then a much later picture by uh, Filippotto, whose um, son, actually he and his son painted the uh, Gettysburg Cyclorama of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, he spent quite a lot of time over here, but did a lot of paintings like this. This painting was actually owned by the Duke of Wellington, uh, his, his actually his uh, son, and it hangs at Apsley House in, in London, near, um, near Hyde Park Corner. And this is a very famous painting, and it does capture 
the British Square because um, after Napoleon captured La Haye he was able to bring his guns up and he sent his cavalry forward um, because the British cavalry that captured the Eagles, they had actually um, been, I won't say destroyed, but they had been surrounded by the, British, the French cavalry. And the French cavalry then charged and the British formed, or the Allies, sorry I keep using the term British, it's habit. Um, the, French, the British formed these squares, uh, which were very difficult to break into, uh, and they were able to repulse the, the charges of the, the French cavalry. Um, so here we've got, again, a typical late 19th century painting. Uh, you have to look hard and, and wide to find any commanders, any generals, any Wellingtons or, or Bonapartes. It's just a, the struggle of common soldiers fighting each other. What about the Dutch? Well, what about the Dutch? Um, there were a lot of Dutch and um, Belgium, because Belgium hadn't, wasn't a, an independent country uh, yet, um, but there were a lot of Flemish and, and Dutch troops at the battle. And um, artists uh, from the Netherlands and the Low Countries have commemorated the battle. This is perhaps the most famous. For those of you who have been to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, uh, you may have seen this. It's massive. It really is a huge painting. And again, this is being used for their uh, bicentennial exhibition. Uh, this has got to be the centerpiece. And just uh, for interest, we sent them uh, 15 photographs uh, of Napoleonic veterans. Uh, every year, veterans of the Napoleonic Wars would go to Paris and lay a wreath at, uh, at Napoleon's tomb and so on uh, and have a good old shimwag. And some photographer, they used to wear their uniforms, and some photographer around about 1857, 58 took pictures of these 15 men. And they're old, wizened men, but they're wearing their uniforms. And I cannot tell you how many times we get requests just uh, last week, and a magazine came yesterday from France that had used our pictures. So we've sent them our 15 sepia photographs because these are real men who fought in the Napoleonic Wars. Many of them may have fought at Waterloo. Uh, but this is, this is Peenemann's uh, Battle of Waterloo. Um, and there's, there's the conquering hero. Um, a few people dying, another officer dying. But the battle's basically over. And to all intents and purposes, this is what people want to see, you know, the, the, the grand hero. This is 1824, so it's, it's still very early on. Uh, the whole idea that, that uh, battles are fought with real people um, had not really sunk in yet. What about some of the, uh, the iconic paintings of, of the battle? Um, and I've only, I've only skimmed the surface. I mean, you could, you could fill a book full of paintings of, of uh, the Battle of Waterloo and all the different events relating to it. But this is one of the most famous ones. Um, you'll see it in a lot of books. And it's by uh, the great Lady Butler, uh, a woman artist working in the 1870s, 1880s. Actually, she worked right through World War I. She married a British officer, a British general, um, and she basically spent a lot of her life painting military scenes, which is unusual for a, a woman artist, but she was just captivated by the glory and the <coughs> heroics and the struggle uh, of, of men in battle. Um, she went to Aldershot, which is down in Hampshire, England, where the British Army was based for many years and still is for what's left of the army. And um, she got the cavalry to charge back and forth so she could actually sketch what horses looked like. You know, the, they're not up in midair. I mean, literally, they have some legs on the ground. And, and, and what, what do they look like when they're charging next to each other? I mean, I don't know whether this is, this is how it would have looked. It would have been very difficult to ride in such close confines. But this is the famous charge uh, of the Royal Scots Greys. Um, who was Scotland's only cavalry regiment. They still are only a cav uh, Scotland's only armoured regiment. Uh, the headquarters at, at Edinburgh Castle, and they are doing an exhibition of um, the Royal Scots Greys at Waterloo, and they borrowed a lot, a lot of our pictures, digital pictures. Um, but as I say, she, she, she had the cavalry charge back and forth uh, in the 1880s, and then she sketched them, and she did this great painting, which is now at Leeds City Art Gallery in Northern England. Um, I mentioned briefly about the, the charge of the, the, uh, heavy, uh, the Union Brigade at Waterloo. This was the uh, British cavalry charge uh, that actually broke through the, the French but actually went too far um, and was surrounded by French cavalry and was quite uh, heavily defeated. But it was during this charge that one of the Eagles was captured. And uh, later on, this regiment uh, had their cap badge. In fact, it's still a cap badge of the Imperial Eagle of the uh, uh, 45th Regiment. Um, 
on their, on their berets. There's the, there's the capture of the eagle. If you go to Edinburgh Castle in the Great Hall, it sits way up above one of the balconies. It's a massive painting uh, by Richard Ansell. And it shows Sergeant Ewart. In fact, again, if you walk to Edinburgh Castle on the Esplanade where they have the, um, the Edinburgh tattoo, when the tattoo is not there, you can actually see his tomb. It's just outside the gate. He was just a sergeant of the regiment, and he captured the eagle, which was uh, regarded as a great, great uh, feat. You know, if you can capture your, your enemy's uh, standards, that, that has always been uh, a high, highlight of, of somebody's uh, experience in war. Ugamon, uh, as I mentioned, this was a major um, part of the battle. Um, it was occupied by British Guard regiments and a few German troops, but mostly British Guard regiments. And it was a large farmhouse. Uh, if you go today, it's sort of uh, boundary walls with some buildings. And um, it was a major point on the battle because had Napoleon been able to capture that, he would have been able to uh, attack Nap uh, Wellington's right wing. But they were able to hold it off. They did break through the doors, uh, but members of the Coldstream Guards were able to close the doors behind them. And of course, that, that single event has captured the imagination of a lot of artists. So we've got a lot of paintings of this. But this is by the Scottish artist Robert Gibb, who painted the famous Thin Red Line painting from the Crimean War. But this is, this is the guards at uh, Rugamon. I don't think you can make the name out, but Ernest Crofts, um, member of the Royal Academy, um, spent a lifetime painting pictures of Waterloo and Wellington and Napoleon and Waterloo and Napoleon and Wellington and Wellington and Napoleon and Wellington. And <laughs> just went on and on. I, he must have made a living because he painted some other <coughs> battle scenes but from other wars, but he just loved this. He went to the battlefield. He sketched Napoleon's um, carriage. Uh, Napoleon's carriage was captured at Waterloo. And for many years, he was on display at uh, Madame Tussauds on, on uh, Baker Street in, in um, London. But then he was destroyed in a fire many years ago. But, Crofts saw it and sketched it and um, was able to incorporate it in here. We actually have a few of the little sketches that he did for various these pictures. Uh, there's Hugamon again. Uh, we, we've actually got the little pencil sketch of this British soldier on the top. Um, so these are all very famous paintings. Um, I tend to focus on British artists. I'm sorry about that. But, it's, uh, um, but I wanted to sort of finish off with some modern pictures, even today. Uh, modern artists are still producing these same sort of scenes that were, were not uncommon in the, in the 19th century. Um, two of these are by Mark Cherms. In fact, you can see his, his name on them. And two of them are by Keith Rocco, who's an American artist who does a lot of uh, American Civil War paintings, American Revolution paintings, as well as Napoleonic paintings. In fact, uh, I've written for Keith. Uh, Keith did a book on um, Napoleonic paintings, and I wrote a bit about Napoleonic art. But, um, you know, as I say, those, are those, those pictures are very uh, similar to, to what you would see in the 19th century. Uh, so artists, even today, are still producing these, these kinds of things for the market. So that's, uh, that's my take on uh, Waterloo in art. Um, I hope I've, I've covered um, quite a lot of ground and given you some new information to think about. But if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Oh. <laughs> Any, any questions? Yes. Among the objects stolen from the Isabel Gardner Museum in uh, Boston a number of years ago was the Napoleonic uh, Eagle Standard. That's correct. Which they have recently offered wow. a reward of $100,000, which they say is far in excess of the value. Oh, you're good. But um, yeah. they also say uh, they are prepared yeah. to uh, identify any fakes. They have some identifying marks on them real one which would uh, identify it. Yes, it's interesting that the, the thieves stole one. Did, did that come from, well it is, did it come from? I don't think it came from Waterloo. I don't think it did. No, no. Um, there's a number of eagles that were captured at different battles, uh, right. the Rosser in the Peninsula War, they captured. I'm not sure where that came from. Yeah. I think um, it was just a souvenir for the thieves. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, a Napoleonic uh, uh, collector. Downstairs on, on, on the exhibition we've actually got some little uh, musket balls. These were given to us only about five months ago, they were found on the battlefield. And I was just reading um, recently, um, I mentioned they're doing archaeological excavations as we speak. Uh, they used 
They use ground penetrating radar and uh, metal detectors and so on to try and locate clusters of, of, of metal work. But they used um, a, um, basically a, a metal detector device on, on some trees around Hougamon. And they got massive readings that yeah. the trees around Hougamon are still filled. These are 200-year-old these are trees. They're still filled with lead that, were, that was fired or, or blown uh, you know, from cannonballs in the trees. So they, they may try and recover some of these, but you know, it's amazing to, to think. They're also trying to find any mass graves. They've never found a mass grave at, at Waterloo. Um, in fact, I, I don't think they've found many graves at all, and yet you know, where do you bury 40,000 men? I mean, in the John Heaviside Clark picture, you could see various burial details just burying where they were. I mean, it, I don't think they were moving bodies around. I think they were just digging holes there and then. And there's a wonderful little engraving, wonderful, not wonderful, an engraving done of, of um, just literally graves and his arms sticking out and so on. And that was done about 1819. So, you know, for many years, bones could be found, as I mentioned, the, the uh, traveler digging up bones and taking the souvenirs. Any, yes? What was the comp uh, composition of the standards? Do you know? I don't, but it was uh, base metal. I don't think Yeah, I think it was, I think it was. Gilded and I think they were, they were gold, but they, were, they weren't, you know, they were gold plated. There's a famous painting um, of Napoleon handing out these standards <coughs> to various regiments. And they're all the same. The British captured to the 45th and the 105th. Um, the 45th was used as the Royal Scots Greys cap badge, the 105th was used as the 1st Dragoons cap badge. Um, but as I say, quite a few of these were kept. Yes? Um, Peter, I have a question that occurs to me when you describe like the, are the bones sticking out of these graves and thinking of the Commonwealth War Graves. Commission. Right. And British cemeteries, American cemeteries, whatever, all over Europe. Yeah. But no clear cemeteries no. at Waterloo. No. Any? No. The, well, the British, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission only deals from 1914 to the present. Uh, so graves in the Crimea were desecrated in the 19th century and also in the 20th century. Uh, there were cemeteries created in the Crimea, but there was nobody to oversee them except locals. Um, South Africa, uh, Boer War, um, no, a, lot of, a lot of these cemeteries had no really government authorities. But there was never a cemetery created at Waterloo. There was never a national cemetery like Gettysburg. Um, you, would have thought the, you would have thought the government would have done something about it, but no. 40,000 dead. Even the French didn't create a, a cemetery. It was just left... To, to locals and, and burial details to just bury them where they were. Surprising. Yeah. So when did armies start to take either artists or photographers with them to record attacks? Uh, Crimea, really, the first one. Although um, Winfield Scott, uh, when he went into Mexico City during the Mexican War, there was a photographer with him. And there's some fuzzy pictures of, of, of him and troops in, in Mexico City. But really, the Crimean War... 1854-55. Um, I saw a very good picture, photograph recently of um, the 1848 revolutions in Paris of a picture of a barricade, but that was just a, a photographer photographing it. But armies taking photographers with them. Um, Crimea. Although Fenton went as a freelance. I mean, he was sent by the government, but he really wasn't working with the army. Susan. You have that wonderful... Um, sketchbook of William Crimean Simpson, yes, Spirit the Hay, 1854, I think. Yes, we have several of his sketchbooks. Yeah. Yes. Um, the patrons either commissioned or purchased the art. What impact do they have on determining the composition? Quite a lot. Quite a lot. Um, in, my, in the class that I teach on uh, artists and images of war, patronage is very important. Um, but with something like Waterloo, yes, is there's really not a propaganda issue there. I mean, Wellington was big. Now, um, some artists, although I'm, not trying, I'm trying to think, with, not with this war, but with other wars, sort of a, a general would com commission a painting. So, OK, there's the general. Um, but I don't think any Waterloo paintings were actually commissioned by Wellington. Wellington was in, in, included in many paintings. 
Uh, people went to take his portrait. People painted his horse, Copenhagen. Um, he bought paintings uh, at, for Apsley House in Strathfield Say, but he never commissioned any, any paintings. Um, now, with Napoleon, of course, during his regime, uh, artists and uh, writers and so on were heavily controlled. So, particularly Baron Gross's painting of the Battle of Eylau. That was, I mean, Eylau was a, a, a bad, I won't say it was a defeat, but the French lost heavily. But the propaganda machinery went into you know, full, full steam to create this battle as this victory. And there's the painting of, of Napoleon, you know, with all these dead Prussians in the foreground. I mean, there's real propaganda, but those, not so much in this battle. Yes. What's the current status of the, the old guard's response to the surrender offer at the end of the battle? The one you cited was debunked for a while in favor of a single syllable expletive that was thought to be more historically accurate. Is the one you cited back, is that the document? I, I cannot speak with any authority on that. I, I don't know. As I say, I'm not a, specialty, a specialist on the battle. Does anybody know? But no, I'm not really not sure about what the Imperial Guard, um, or how they reacted. Well, in the, in the children's history books, Cameron is said to have said, the old guard dies but does not surrender. Yeah. Very photogenic. Yeah. Um, he's thought to have simply said, Mared. Any <laughs> <laughs> question? Yes. Are these photographs or part of a painting? Uh, the, these are four, four separate. Uh, these are four separate paintings. I just basically uh, actually took these from the internet yesterday, uh, just to give you an idea of, of modern paintings. Uh, but these are all paintings. You can actually buy them as prints. Uh, Mark Cherms, um, <coughs> if you go to his website, you can buy these prints. Um, yeah, they're quite popular. Any other questions? Well, if not, thank you and.